Hello everyone. In this episode, uh, we'll answer the question how we find subgame perfect Nash equilibrium uh, in relatively simpler games. So what if the game is a finite game, finite horizon, and what if the game has perfect information, meaning everybody can observe uh, all the previous actions uh, perfectly. So here's one example. All right, player one moves. Uh, well, I forgot to name the actions. Let's call them A, B. If he plays B, the game is over. If he plays A, the game uh, will move on or the, uh, it's going to be the second player's turn to choose left, right. And whatever player two chooses, player one then chooses H, H or T or U or, or, or D and then the game is over. So this is a game with perfect information because everybody can observe all the previous actions. Well, it's a simple game relatively. So what do we do? Well, uh, we use the uh, backward induction. So what's the idea behind backward induction? Simple. Look at the longest uh, history, non-terminal history, the longest. All right. Well, then uh, let's say it is history HK. So it's a longest non-terminal history. That basically means after history HK, somebody is going to make a move and then, I mean, choose an action, then the game will be over. So for that reason, look at this player, um, PH of K. All right. So this player is going to choose, you know, possibly finite uh, or maybe infinite, doesn't matter, uh, actions. Well, what is his profit maximizing or payoff maximizing action? Well, well in, in this sub game, this player is supposed to choose that action. Well, do this for all the uh, histories with length K. Remember, this is the longest history. And so uh, if there's any other history, as long as that history, well, it's, its length should be K. Well, once I'm, I'm, I'm done with histories with length K, uh, move upwards. Like look at all the histories with length K minus one. All right, so these are histories where some player is going to make a move. All right, so this is P H K minus one. All right, so he's gonna make a move, maybe infinitely many of them, we don't know. But the thing is, whatever he chooses, the game is not going to finish, okay? Because remember, this is not the longest history. Uh, somebody will also move. Well, but don't forget, in the previous step, we already uh, chose the optimal action on this uh, history, I mean, after this history. And we also, remember, we did this, uh, uh, you know, we looked at all the histories with length K. So we also found the optimal actions here, optimal actions here. So what does that mean? That means, so fixing the players in the next round, let's call it next round or period, are going to behave as we just found in the previous step. What would be the optimal action for this player? So if he plays, for example, this action or strategy, well, he should assume fairly enough that his opponent after his move is going to choose whatever the optimal action is for him, which we found in the previous step. All right, so find the optimal action for this player. Well, do this for all the histories that length K minus one. Well, the next step, do exactly the same thing for all the histories with length K minus two, K minus three. Well, because this is a finite game, so K is a finite, well, it is going to stop at some point, H, zero, which is the null history. So that's basically where the first player makes the move. And so find the best option, best uh, sort of payoff maximizing action for him. Again, given that uh, for the remaining of the game, players are going to be choosing uh, actions as we found in the earlier stages. All right. So that is going to give us one path where from the beginning to the end, uh, if you follow the arrows, you're going to say, well, you know what, that is the uh, uh, sort of the optimal outcome or the solution of this game. And then we have to construct the sub game perfect Nash equilibrium strategy profile. It's a little bit tricky. Well, the best is to work on some example. So here, again, if you look at this game, uh, you don't really have to count the histories, but the longest non-terminal history has length 
two, right? For example, AR or AL. These are the longest histories, non-terminal histories. Well, the question is, after AR, uh, or alternatively, in the sort of undergrad games, we say, look at the last sub-games, all right? So this is basically the sub-game starting with player one moving, right? Well, I mean, either way, uh, we are actually <clears throat> pointing out player one here and then player one here once again. So here, after this history, AR, assuming that it will occur, what would be the optimal action for player one? So here, the nice thing is, this is no longer a sort of a strategic interaction, right? Player one is just making a move alone uh, without really worrying about what his opponents are gonna be doing because they're not, there is no simultaneous move. So player one, he knows if he chooses U, he will certainly get to pay off zero, and if he chooses D, he will certainly get three. So obviously he's going to aim for three, and so he's gonna play D here after this history, AR. And remember, he can observe those histories. However, after history AL, um, he's gonna go for payoff one, meaning he's going to play H. All right, so that's basically the first step. Now I'm going to look at histories with length one. So what are they? Non-terminal histories with length one. Well, it is basically a, that's it. Uh, B is a terminal history. So after A, player two is going to make a move, left or right. Well, if he chooses left, he knows what he's gonna get. Well, he's gonna get one. Well, why is he ignoring this? Well, because uh, we assume that players can um, uh, predict how their rational opponents are going to behave once they observe the history A and L. Uh, player one is a rational guy and he will certainly not go 40, he will go for H. So therefore, if player two plays left, he's gonna get one. If, he, if, if, if player two plays right, however, he will also get one. Huh, so what does that mean? That means both left and right are going to be payoff maximizing because they, have, they, they give him exactly the same payoff. Well, then put the arrows on both uh, branches, both actions which means both of them are actually uh, payoff maximizing. Fine, well then, uh, the final step, well, what is the optimal strategy for player one, right? I mean, here, the third stage is where we're looking the histories uh, of length zero, meaning the, the, the initial history. Player one, if he moves and plays B, he's gonna get two for sure. If he plays A, however, hmm, well, that depends on what player two will be doing, right? If he plays left, he's gonna get one. If he plays right, he's gonna get three. So therefore, all right, so therefore, uh, this um, extensive form game is slightly more complicated because there's not just one subgame perfect Nash equilibrium, there are two, all right, uh, which is exactly why I picked this example. So what do we do? Well, we basically look at therefore two cases. Well, why two cases? Well, because player two may play one of two actions and hence two cases. So one of them, two plays left. Well, obviously player one doesn't know what is player two thinking, right? Well, but that's the thing. So remember a strategy profile is a subgame perfect Nash equilibrium or Nash equilibrium or equilibrium in our understanding of game in, in, in game theory is that each player is basically forming a conjecture about how his opponents are going to behave, and then they are basically choosing actions or strategies uh, sort of uh, by best responding that belief, all right? So here, this is kind of player one believes that player two is going to play left. Under disbelief, what should player one play? Well, if two plays left, if this is your belief, well, as you see, player one is gonna get one. However, if he plays A, if he plays B, he's gonna get two. So therefore, in this case, one will play B, all right? Well, if two, so this is the case one, let's call it case one, and case two, what if two plays uh, right? Well, in this case, meaning if player two, if player one conjectures that player two is going to play right here, he knows he's indifferent, but if he plays right, well then 
uh, player one is going to get three if he chooses A, but two if he chooses B. So therefore, he should be choosing A. One plays uh, A. All right? Hmm. So then what? Well, that means we should construct or we can construct potentially two different equilibrium, subgame perfect Nash equilibrium. Well, the first one, uh, two subgame perfect Nash equilibrium. So the first one is basically the following. Player one is going to play B here, all right? And player two, remember player one's conjecture is left, all right? And then player one is going to play H here and D here. Don't forget the strategy of each player should specify what that player is going to do after every possible history. Although some of those histories will never be reached because of those players previous moves. All right. So what does that mean? If I uh, collect all these together, I'm going to write player one strategies and then comma play two's strategy. Player two's strategy is simple. Uh, left. Play one strategy is, uh, remember, I said B, and then here H and D. So B, H, and D. So that's one uh, perfect subgame perfect Nash equilibrium. Well, what is the outcome? Well, because player one is playing B, the outcome corresponding to this strategy profile is 2, 0. All right. Well, what about the second one? Well, the second one, remember, player two. I mean, player one believes that his opponent is going to be playing right. So therefore, player one plays A here and then H here and D here. So that is the second subgame perfect Nash equilibrium. What is the outcome corresponding to that one? Well, A and then R and then H is irrelevant, D, so 3, 1. Outcome 3, 1. Okay. So that's it. This is how we find all subgame perfect Nash equilibrium in a game like this, in pure strategies, obviously. There might be mixed strategies as well. How come? Well, player two, remember here, is indifferent between left and right. Well, maybe he will randomize. I mean, is it optimal? That's another question, but maybe he will randomize it. So there may exist mixed strategy Nash equilibrium, but for simplicity, uh, let's ignore it and focus only on the pure strategies, okay? Okay, so <clears throat> let's make some observations about these two subgame perfect Nash equilibrium strategy profiles. Well, when you look at, or when you compare the payoffs, uh, clearly one of them is inefficient, right? I mean, this, the first strategy profile gives player one to players two zero. However, the second strategy profile is clearly better. I mean, both players are actually going to benefit out of this. I mean, how come this can be a solution of a game. I mean, isn't that moronic? Well, kind of agree, but don't forget, we just applied the concept of backward induction and, and optimization, all right? Well, well, I mean, we didn't do anything wrong. So that means our concepts of equilibrium are not always giving us the perfect uh, solutions or they do not eliminate sometimes weird outcomes. So maybe we should strengthen our definitions or, or sort of equilibrium concepts, which is perfectly fine. But this is not the point I would like to argue. What I would like to argue, how come this is a Nash equilibrium, first of all? So don't forget, Nash equilibrium doesn't mean that uh, players' payoffs will be globally maximized. It is just a stability concept. Given your opponent's strategies, are you doing your best or not? So here, this strategy profile basically summarizing the following. Player two is holding some belief left. His opponent is going to play left. So he's basically scared that his opponent is gonna play left, all right? For some reason, he may be scared. Maybe he is pessimistic guy. So he knows his opponent may go for this or this. But the thing is, player two is just indifferent between these two actions. So there is no perfect rationale behind eliminating L, right? L is a perfectly viable option for a player two. 
So yes, playing left is going to hurt player one and eventually hurt both of them. But nevertheless, once I play A, player two may play left, all right? So for that reason, if this is the belief player one is holding, all right, so my opponent is gonna play left. So the game will never come to this side. So three and zero, these are payoffs. I mean, three at least is the payoff that I should eliminate from my observation, uh, for, from my um, uh, sort of uh, uh, ultimate goal, because I cannot get that. I believe my opponent is going to play left. So given all that, well, do I really want to, as player one, do I really want to deviate? Well, playing B is going to give me two, which is the highest payoff I can achieve given that my opponents shift the game towards this side, because whatever I play, I'm going to end up either zero or one. So therefore, let me go for B and get two. All right. Well, so here the thing is, do player two uh, commit to playing right? and then signal this to his opponents. Like before the game, they communicate and player two says, look, if you think I'm gonna play left, uh, I'm going to get two, uh, I'm sorry, zero, and you're gonna get two. So I will make sure, I, I'll, I'll make sure I am going to play right. And so this is going to be the outcome. So maybe, maybe before these guys play this game, they communicate and player two sends a signal to, or sort of a you know, open and clear message to his opponent and saying that he's going to play right. Well, does this change the outcome? Well, maybe yes, maybe no, right? So that depends on whether they can actually write implicit contracts uh, between each other. So if these are two friends, all right, and once the game starts and two actually happens to play left instead of right, all right, uh, well then, again, if they are friends, afterwards player one can punish his friend or just say, well, I mean, you promised me you're going to play right, but you didn't. So you see what I mean? So friendship, for example, or maybe ability of writing a contract, like if you do not play right, I am going to punish you or I'm going to get some of your reward, whatever. So if this is some sort of contracting is not possible between these two players, well, then we cannot assume that player two is actually commit himself and play right. Because once player one plays A, two literally has no reason, at least this is how we think, when we analyze a, a game from a non-cooperative approach. So non-cooperative because they can't really write contracts, so they can't cooperate. Uh, all these tools are not available. So player two has no reason to stick to his commitment and play right, because this is the one game they're gonna play and then for the rest of their life, they will never see one another. That's the idea of non-cooperative approach in a sense. So for that reason, we can't really eliminate this 